Section 1 of The New Science of Controlled Breathing, Volume 1 and 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The New Science of Controlled Breathing, Volume 1 and 2, by Edward Lanco. Forward. The staff of life is not bread, it is breath. For you can live days without drink and weeks without food, but you can only live a few minutes without air. You would think, inasmuch as the human race has been breathing for at least 500,000 years, that men and women today would know how to breathe. As a matter of fact, however, consciously controlled breathing is known but to very few people. These few fortunate individuals have been rewarded by nature in the way nature always rewards those who follow her laws. She blesses them with magnificent constitutions, tireless energy, and the strength and beauty that comes from radiant health, skin that shows the rich blood flowing under its clear surfaces, sparkling eyes, and the vivacious manner that attracts and holds the attention of both men and women alike. This nature does for those who rightly use her great gift. Of the few in all the world who know the inmost secrets of the art of breathing, Edward Lanco, the talented author of this course, is perhaps the greatest. The editor of Physical Culture magazine says of him, Mr. Edward Lanco is rated by many critics as the greatest basso in America. The richness, residence, depth, power, flexibility, and cello-like beauty of his voice has not been duplicated in America for years. Mr. Lanco is 35 years old, weight 205 pounds stripped, height 6 feet 1 one half inches, chest 44 one half inches, waist 38 inches. He is Russian-American, born in Terrytown, New York. In 1902, at the age of 19, Lanco was offered the principal base engagement with the Bostonians by Barnaby and MacDonald, which he declined on the account of a desire for further study. The same year he was offered a tour with Adelina Patti, which he declined for the same reason. In 1906, he started his career in Europe, where he sang at all the principal opera houses and in concerts. In 1911, he returned to America and made his debut on the opening evening of the season with the Boston Opera Company. Before going to Boston, he studied Pelléas et Mélisande in Paris at the first rehearsal at which the famous composer, Debussy, was present. He received the superlative compliment from the composer, who said to him, in your voice I hear for the first the mystic timbre of voice I thought of when I composed the part fifteen years ago. Mr. Lanco sang all the nine performances of this opera in Boston with Madame Leblanc and Mary Garden. In 1912 to 1913, at the first performance of the Magic Flute at the Metropolitan Opera House, the management brought Mr. Lanco over from Boston for the first half-dozen performances, where three of the New York newspaper critics pronounced him the greatest basso in America, one critic saying a voice of amazing beauty, he is by long odds the greatest basso in America. In April 1917, while attending a garden party at Governor's Island, Mr. Lanco noticed that the speaking voice of Colonel Hartman was naturally exceedingly well-placed or resonant, and asked the colonel if he had studied to produce it that way, to which the colonel answered, No, I always spoke that way, and always wanted to find out how I did it so as to show it to younger officers, but I couldn't. Mr. Lanco then showed the colonel, by pressing his hand on the colonel's abdomen, how by nature he used that organ in support, a support which most of us had to learn, but which came quite natural to him. The quick mind of Colonel Hartman absorbed the value of the idea at once, 
and he asked Mr. Lanco to teach this subject at Camp Gordon, Georgia, the largest development camp in the country. Here, official instructors of various subjects from all the other camps in the country from Maine to San Francisco were gathered for special instructions. From 6.45 a.m., Mr. Lanco would have classes ranging from 25 to 1,100 and gradually developed 41 officer assistant instructors so that several thousand men were doing the work at the same time. The commanding general, Brigadier General William Sage, and all of his staff were in his morning class. After the third week, Mr. Lanco was asked to mess at headquarters and live at the former home of Brigadier General Shaw. The results of his work were more than astounding. Men who had apparently no voices at all and who had pain in the throat while giving commands suddenly found that it was a pleasure to use the voice. On the other hand, men whose health was run down so that they were on their way to forced retirement were so changed in appearance that their civilian friends asked them what they were doing. Surgeon General Rupert Blue thought so highly of the health-building power of Mr. Lanco's course of instruction that he made the following statement to Mr. Lanco in Washington. Use my name for anything you like in connection with your system of teaching breath control. Another health authority said, Give the world two generations of children taught this trained, scientific method of breathing, and you'll make the community free of consumption. Many of the world's greatest singers have profited by Mr. Lanco's instructions. Mary Garden, director of the Chicago Opera Company and famous prima donna, has written, Half the world does not know that correct breathing means health, happiness, and contentment. I had the joy of learning this truth from Mr. Lanco. Every day my voice became better and my health, too. His work is really great. In this complete course of lessons, Mr. Lanco tells all the secrets of his wonderful work. Within a few days, you too, by following the simple directions Mr. Lanco advises, may well be on the road to such health, strength, mental clearness, and physical beauty as you have never known before, for you will be working in harmony with nature and with nature's greatest and beneficent laws. The Publisher End of Section 1 Read by Martha Heaton, October 2023. Section 2 of The New Science of Controlled Breathing, Volume 1 and 2, by Edward Lanco. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Importance of Consciously Controlled Breathing Air is truly the breath of life. It is the vital fluid that animates our being, that stimulates into activity every one of the billion of cells that go to make up the body. It is a fact, conceded by every scientific man today, that the oxygen in the air we breathe is absolutely the greatest purifying force in all nature. Yet there is but one way to get oxygen into your lungs and into your system, and this is to breathe it in. As long ago as 2,000 years before the Christian era, the Chinese and the Hindus made elaborate studies in the art of breathing. Indeed, they developed a complex science having to do with the control of the breath. Certain forms of breathing were employed for the cure of various diseases. Thus, for example, it was believed that controlled inhalations and exhalations would allay fevers, or, in a contrary condition of the body, induce a salutary rise in temperature. In India, the Buddhist priests were at pains to practice breath control so as always to command deep, quiet action of the lungs. In this measured breathing, the number of breaths was greatly reduced. The usual 18 to 22 breaths per minute were reduced to 6 or 8. Experience justified the theories of the priests concerning the value of a controlled breathing. Its merits have stood the tests of ages, and today, in the Orient proper, breathing is still deemed the fountain of health. Aside from the distinctly physical advantages derived from breath control, 
There results also a poise of mind that is most desirable in its benefits to the whole nature of the man. Later in history, both the Greeks and the Romans practiced controlled breathing for hygienic purposes and for the attainment of bodily perfection. They even went further than the Orientals of an earlier epoch, for they deliberately set out to enlarge the chest cavity. They realized that the principal part of the body is the trunk, and that in this the chief constituent is the chest. The success they attained in the development of superb physiques is demonstrated by the examples that survive to us of their classic art. They were able to attain a bodily perfection unequaled in the history of the world. In their methods, controlled breathing was the chief agent. In Europe, during the Middle Ages, this science of breath suffered from increasing neglect and finally died out. As an appalling commentary on the neglect of proper breathing by the mass of mankind, we may consider the fact now generally admitted by the medical profession that fully one-half of the world's death rate is due to consumption. The fact could hardly be otherwise. Any experienced physician is well aware that only a small part of the lungs is ordinarily used by the average person. A large portion of the breathing apparatus is in most cases never employed at all. Naturally, inevitably, such areas in the lungs weaken and become degenerate. They offer a breeding place for the germs of various infections. Why ordinary systems of exercise fail. The various systems of gymnastics are designed for the surface building of the body. The exercises affect almost exclusively the outer muscular structure. The scientific cultivation of the breath, on the contrary, acts directly on the inner, vital organs. These are strengthened and developed from the outset. Thus, a sure foundation is laid on which to build toward physical perfection and the true beauty which is, or should be, the heritage of every healthy man or woman. Any ordinary method must, of necessity, prove itself as ineffective as it is illogical. The majority of athletes exhibit exterior muscles of most impressive bulk. It is a curious fact, however, that the bony structure which measures the chest cavity shows only a trifling development when deprived of its muscular support. It must always be borne in mind that the strength of the body lies in its organic power, not in the surface muscles. In fact, the larger the surface muscles are, the more strength is taken from the organic vitality in order to support and feed them. It is by this reason of this drain upon the inner forces that athletes so often die young. Abnormal development of the muscular system at the expense of organic vitality is a folly, always dangerous, and often fatal. How we live on air. Air is the substance on which principally we feed. What we eat is of secondary importance. The purity of the blood and the strength of the arteries through which it throbs depend absolutely upon right breathing. The greater the quantity of air taken into the lungs, the more oxygen for the purification of the blood, the constant and prime requirement for health. The system of breathing, which I advocate in this work, is not a mere matter of theory, something vague and experimental. It is concrete. It is exact. Its worth has definitely been proved. I have demonstrated the merit of the exercises in my own case. During a year and a half of practice, my chest measurement increased from 38 inches to 42. Breathing Color into Pale Faces With many flat-chested and anemic girls, I have seen an equally astonishing improvement. I have seen their chests develop, their busts become firm and rounded, and telltale hollows under the collarbones fill out. Almost invariably, flabby muscles become resilient, pale, sallow cheeks become pink with the sweet flush of healthy youth. Incidentally, I have discovered a variety of virtues in controlled breathing. Thus is the case of that most annoying among minor ailments, a cold. 
I have found that I could invariably be rid of it within 24 hours by means of strenuous breathing exercises for 20 minutes at a time, repeated often during the day. For a more formal endorsement of this system, I may refer to the Société Internationale de la Tuberculose. An investigation by the Society was reported favorably at The Hague and London. In this connection, it should be remembered that the world at large has not yet begun to realize the supreme value of correct, quiet, slow breathing for general health. Its practice regularly would unquestionably prove a preventive of tubercular disease. Its judicious employment by those already affected would prove a powerful remedial agent. Consumptives who seek the pure air of the mountains or plains often fail to receive benefit for the simple reason that they have never learned the proper manner of breathing. To such, the best of air is useless as the most nourishing food to the one who has no teeth with which to chew. When one inhales, the lungs seem to grow. As the cells are filled with air, the chest proportionately enlarges. At the same time, the ribs and the diaphragm assume a new position. The result is that the chest, the between-rib muscles, and the diaphragm are all very strenuously exercised. By proper breathing, the various muscles involved are constantly trained. They are developed and made elastic to such an extent that the lungs are not required to stand alone in their resistance against adverse conditions, both within and without. The lungs expand during inhalation. They contract during exhalation. A full breath dilates the lungs to their maximum capacity. They relax to the minimum size when the breath is completely expelled. By practice, one can readily learn to influence the various movements and gradually to control them. The practice of the first exercises in the series given includes sudden exhalation, slow exhalation, and rhythmic exhalation. These tend to reduce the quantity of air that is left in the lungs when the breath is expelled. Such residual air is poisonous and an excess of it due to improper breathing is very injurious. Its retention in the lung cells not only lessens the space available to be filled with fresh air, but it also acts as a direct agent for ill in the bodily processes. How consciously controlled breathing makes you resist disease. It should be added, and with emphasis, that the habit of deep breathing makes one immune to the germs of various diseases. The practice of breath control gives a toughened fiber to the whole breathing apparatus. This and the constant purifying of the blood develop the body's vital forces to the highest degree possible, against which disease is rendered powerless. Thus one may enter into possession of the health and strength that are his by right, and thus, and thus only, shall he know the joy of life. Here is an illustration of what may be done by serious and persistent attention to breathing. It must be understood, however, that I by no means advise others to follow my example, although I believe it quite possible for anybody, man, woman, boy, or girl, by constant practice to develop the same perfect resistance that I myself have. For a period of five years, I have made it a rule to dress in January exactly as in July, except in the matter of an overcoat. I go without underclothing. I wear no waistcoat, vest. I do not take exception to the wearing by others of such garments during the winter months. But for myself, as I gradually learned to take advantage of systematic breathing exercises and thus to charge my blood abundantly with oxygen, the necessity for much clothing disappeared. Underwear grew to be uncomfortable. I found myself both happier and healthier without it. When I wore the heavier clothing in winter, I suffered from frequent colds. Now I am rarely troubled in that manner. If, through carelessness, I do catch a cold, I am able easily to throw it off 
within 24 hours by means of extra practice in deep breathing together with a short fast. I do not wish to infer that the heavier clothing is the cause of colds. My point is, rather, that the extra amount of oxygen I take into my blood supplies the place of the garments formerly worn by me, as well as acts in consuming or burning up the poisonous material that gathers in the tissues and tends to make you feel cold. Let me repeat that I do not advise anyone to experiment with the wearing of summer apparel in the winter until after several months of systematic breathing exercises with the consequent enriching of the blood. The matter, like that of the cold bath, is one for individual discrimination. In my own case, the lighter garb has actually become a necessity for comfort's sake. Why we should establish schools to teach the new science of breathing. Whatever the different systems for muscular and health development may be, the value of developing those vital inner organs, the heart, the lungs, and the digestive organs, is easily understood. A large arm or a wonderful leg development cannot help these inner organs if they are naturally weak or if they have been weakened. The point is, what will give health to these organs, the fundamental or motor power to all health? Special exercises for the lungs that is, conscious deep breathing exercises for a specific period of time will give results which few realize. It is all so simple that most of us cannot believe it, like all truths. The maximum oxygenation of the blood through taking in large quantities of air, thereby feeding the organs with purer blood, the improved circulation, the exhilarated heartbeat, the drawing away of drowsiness from the brain, the improved digestion through the unconscious massage of the lower organs. All these will show what results are obtainable. If the children in our schools were taught conscious, deep, slow breathing at that period of their lives when the body and mind are flexible, the habit would easily be formed for life. This habit would surely wipe out consumption within two generations. Millions of human beings die yearly from this, the greatest human menace. Why not, therefore, have schools for breathing? Surely this experiment is entitled to a place among the hundreds of other experiments which have been and which are being tried. End of Section 2 Read by Martha Heaton October 2023《ビジョンの世界を変えるプロジェクト》の1から2の記事です。この記事は、リブロックスレコーディングの中で、この記事は、この記事は、この記事は、この記事は、この記事は、この記事は、この記事は、この記事は、この記事は、この記事は、この記事は、この記事は、この記事は、この記事は、この記事は、この記事は、この記事は、この記事は、この The net results, however, have been unsatisfactory. The appeal of this propaganda has met with comparatively little response. The truth as to the importance of right method in breathing may have been presented, but it has remained valueless since it has not been accepted and acted upon by those to whom it was addressed. Perhaps in great measure, the fault lies in the fact that the various advocates of breath systems have been too vague in their teachings and have expounded the theory rather than the practice. It is for this reason that I have been at pains to describe all necessary exercises in such detail as to make the practice of them simple and easy for every reader. I have arranged them in such order as to make sure A rapid progress toward perfect breath control with its consequent increase in health, beauty, efficiency, and happiness. It seems indeed difficult to impress on anybody not familiar with the wonderful advantages of correct breathing a full recognition of the vital bearing breath control has on the well being of the individual. Air is too ridiculously cheap to be much respected by most persons. And two, breathing is ordinarily automatic, requiring no thought. 
Naturally enough, then, most persons give it no attention, since they have no realization of its importance. Nature has provided that all great things should be essentially simple. It is thus with the process of breathing, which is the chief vital functioning of the body. An ancient philosopher has said, The more we desire to have that which is superfluous, the more we meet with difficulties. The more necessary the thing is for living beings, the more easily it is found and the cheaper it is. Air, water, and food are indispensable to man. Air is most necessary, for if man is without air a few moments he dies, whilst he can be without water a day or longer. Air is undoubtedly found more easily and is cheaper than water. Water is more necessary than food and is proportionately cheaper. Note well the undeniable fact, as asserted by the philosopher, that air is of the first importance. If air had to be paid for, or if only a very limited amount were to be distributed to each consumer, there would be an instant and universal recognition of its supreme value. Its restriction would compel every individual to appreciate the unique worth of the true elixir of life. What mortality statistics teach us? According to statistics of the United States Census, the annual death rate from all causes is one million. Of this number, 400,000 die from diseases of the lungs. The figures demonstrate that two persons, at least out of every five, come to their death prematurely and from a preventable cause. Another aspect of the truth is gaining wider recognition day by day throughout the civilized world. This has to do with the appreciation of fresh air as a fundamental of health. There has been remarkable awakening to this effect within a generation. Today, the preferred treatment of consumptives demands that they shall live out of doors if possible. The windows in all the hospitals are seldom closed. Sleeping porches are built wherever space permits. It is unfortunately true, however, that there has been little advancement in general knowledge as to the science, the art, and the practice of correct breathing. Yet I have been surprised and gratified by the eager attention of those friends to whom I have made explanations and given exhibitions during the last few years. Without an exception, these friends have manifested a keen desire to learn the secrets of breath control and to win for themselves the benefits thus conferred. In order to broaden my knowledge and to render it exact, I have made serious studies and experiments through a term of years. I am convinced that if, instead of gymnasiums, institutions were established for training in the development of breath control, the grim death toll of one million for one year in our country would dwindle amazingly. The Gymnastics of Breathing You must always remember that the correct carriage of the body during the period of the breathing exercises is a factor of great importance since the lungs function variously in accordance with different postures of the body. After the fundamental principles of deep breathing are mastered, the next step is to connect it with different exercises, respectively, of the arms, the legs, the trunk, and the head. At first it will be found somewhat difficult to combine attention to the various parts concerned, but the ability to do this will readily be mastered by practice. The point involved is that the muscles of the chest have a reflex action on other muscles. For instance, when the lungs are full of air, all the cells are inflated to the utmost, the chest is stretched, the diaphragm is drawn down. The various muscles of the chest, of the back, and of the abdomen are in a state of high tension. This tension could last only during the time in which the breath is held. Moreover, care must be taken that it shall not influence any other muscles besides those directly concerned. When you exercise the arms rhythmically while the breath is being held, such movement of the arms must not be permitted to influence the breath. The result to be striven for is an intelligent control of the muscles so that the various groups shall be made to act independently. 
every school of gymnastics seeks to attain the same end with a difference in this system of breath control the lungs are trained the chief requisite for all health beauty and vigor and now that we have given this much attention to the why let us go forward to the how of breath control preparation for the exercises the clothing should be loose especially around the neck and chest it is advisable when convenient that the collar should be removed for the duration of the exercises the buttons of the coat and vest too should be unfastened after a short time it will be found that these buttons must be placed nearer the edge of the garments the girl or woman who wishes to get the best results from these exercises should be sure to have no clothing on that may bind her about the waist constrict her diaphragm or press upon her abdominal muscles it is almost superfluous to say that she should never attempt her exercises without at least first divesting herself of her corset if she wears corsets it is better to wear merely the comfortable union suit that so many sensible girls and women wear now for this affords perfect freedom of movement and permits every muscle to be properly tensed and relaxed by the deep breathing exercises and the gymnastic movements that accompany them the first requirement throughout all the exercises is a preliminary releasing from the lungs of the old dead air which is a continual source of self-poisoning this accumulation must be driven out from the points of the lungs before the new breath is taken it is repeated also on the conclusion of all the exercises it must never be neglected the cleansing breath explanation in detail this exercise prefaces and ends every exercise in breathing by prefacing an exercise it makes space in the lungs for a capacity volume of new breath by ending an exercise it serves the important function of relaxing the whole body it should be studied very carefully exhale blow out energetically saying s between the teeth exaggerate the hissing sound of s, s this protects the throat while doing this bring the shoulders and head forward this helps to press out the air which is never entirely removed from the lungs we call this the residual air after exhaling you can begin the second part of this exercise by doing the opposite inhale slowly through the nose gradually bringing the outstretched arms overhead performing a circle also bring head and shoulders back filling the lungs in all parts to great capacity pause for one or two seconds and relax suddenly this is difficult to do correctly to relax suddenly means to relax with a crash the breath escapes at once the arms fall the knees bend and all this must take place together with well-opened mouth you say ha to make the breath escape quickly this very important sudden relaxation may lack snap and precision at first but after a few days the mind will become trained to its action after this relaxation take two shorter breaths in the same way then pause before repeating the cleansing breath in condensed form position erect with arms at sides exhale blow out quickly saying s inhale through the nose lifting arms to front hold breath in position exhale suddenly ha bringing arms down to the sides two short cleansing breaths pause 10 seconds before repeating ordinarily do this exercise six to eight times with pauses between the short controlled breath explanation in detail exhale first the cleansing breath this precedes every exercise after the cleansing breath inhale through the nose while placing the hands lightly on hips hold the breath a few seconds and open the mouth do not permit any breath to escape 
the opening of the mouth proves to yourself that there is no contraction at the throat. Instead, the diaphragm is holding the breath. Now exhale saying s between the teeth with relaxed throat. It is very important to observe that the chest is held high for the first half of expiration. Then let it sink quickly with the breath and take two or three quick cleansing breaths. Observe that the shoulders do not rise while inhaling, that you really inhale, not that you stretch the chest muscles and lift the shoulders as I have seen even athletes do when asked to take a deep breath. Besides opening the mouth during the period of held breath, it would be well to turn the neck several times to prove its freedom from tension. The short controlled breath in condensed form. Position erect with arms at sides. Exhale as in exercise one saying S. Inhale through the nose placing hands on hips. Hold breath one to four seconds mouth open. Exhale S. First holding the chest high then letting it sink slowly with breath. Two to three cleansing breaths. Pause before repeating. To be done five or six times with pauses. The Climax Breath Explanation in Detail This exercise is the most difficult of all breathing gymnastics and should not be attempted by the sick. It requires great endurance. Even an athlete should not attempt it until the others are well in hand. The first part is exactly like the exercise marked the short controlled breath. But in the second part, instead of expelling the air suddenly, you proceed to exhale very slowly after holding the breath a few seconds. Care should be taken to see that the upper chest is held high as long as possible while exhaling. With the last atom of breath leaving the lungs, drop, relax the shoulders, and whole frame. Quickly take two or three more cleansing breaths to quiet the heart and lungs. When one is ready for this strenuous exercise, it becomes a great force for building breadth and depth to the chest and new inner vitality. During the first few weeks, one performance of this exercise is enough for the day. After the second month, two exercises per day. Fifth month, three exercises per day, etc., very gradually increasing the number. The Climax Breath in Condensed Form Exhale, s. Inhale slowly, hiss, through the smallest opening of lips and closed teeth. Place hands on diaphragm. Hold breath several seconds. Exhale slowly, s through small opening of lips and teeth. Several cleansing breaths. Long pause. This is never to be performed more than twice at one time during the first two months. With girls or women who are inclined to stoutness, it may sometimes be well to place the hands immediately under the busts, slightly supporting the breasts instead of on the hips. It will be found that the relaxing movements can thus be performed with more comfort until such time as the muscles supporting the bust gain in strength and elasticity. Care should be taken at first not to take in too much breath, nor to hold the breath too long. This matter, however, is entirely individual. Naturally, a greater amount of care must be exercised by a delicate child or by a consumptive than by a healthy youth. And right here it must be emphasized that if you are a businessman sitting for long hours every day at a desk, you should, in order to derive the maximum amount of good from these breathing exercises, plan to stand up near the open window and spend a few minutes practicing some of these simple exercises. You will often find that what you thought was the fatigue of overwork is nothing more or less than staying too long in a close atmosphere and making an insufficient use of your organs of respiration. The feeling of freshness these exercises will impart 
the increased vigor and the enhanced clearness of mind that will come to you will prove a grateful source of surprise. Many men, formerly in the habit of visiting for a cocktail, take a few deep breaths in this scientific manner. They claim that this fresh air cocktail is better than any coffee or liquor stimulant, and it can be certain that nothing but good effects can ever follow it. By this system of breathing, you can build up a wonderful physique. You can become strong and active and have a super abundance of health and vitality, and without spending more than a few minutes of your day at your breathing exercises. After a short time, the habit for slow, deep breathing is formed, and as with all habits, it requires no attention whatsoever. Hence, for controlled breathing. It should go almost without saying that to get the best effects from air, you should breathe the purest air obtainable. Air which is full of dust particles, for instance, may be actually irritating to the delicate mucous membrane that lines the nose, throat, bronchial tubes, and air cells of the lungs. This dust contains particles of organic matter derived from the excrement of horses and dogs, from dried atoms of offal and decaying vegetable matter, or from dried mud impregnated with urine. Indeed, it is very largely upon these particles that the microorganisms, arch enemies of mankind as well as of animal kind, are carried on their errand of destruction. These microorganisms are most abundant in the air of inhabited rooms, and the more people in the room, the greater the number of microbes present. So don't be afraid of open windows, day or night. Remember Florence Nightingale's quaint observation, windows are made to be opened. Always breathe through the nose. It should be remembered also that so far as possible, all inhalation of air should be through the nose. This is for two very important reasons. First, the fine hairs lining the nasal passages act as a sieve through which the inspired air is strained. Further than this, the lower turbinated bodies in the nose and the lower half of the middle turbinates are covered with tiny cells, ciliated tissue, protruding from the membrane covering of the turbinates. These cells catch and hold any particles of dust or other matter that may have slipped through the hair screen of the nostrils. Thus dust, germs, and other harmful material are removed from the air currents and prevented from reaching the lung cells. The next most important reason is that the chambers of the nose with their wonderfully rich blood supply act as temperature regulators. If you breathe air at zero temperature through the nose, it is actually warmed to body temperature before it passes into the bronchial tubes. If you were to breathe desert air, or the air of a blast furnace heated to 130 degrees, this superheated air would be cooled approximately to body temperature before it passed into the lung cells. If there is a tendency to breathe through the mouth, this will be manifested most decidedly at night when you are asleep and the muscles are relaxed. If you find that you are in the habit of sleeping with the mouth open, awakening in the morning with a dry, harsh throat, it might be well to adopt the device which Dr. William H. Fitzgerald introduced to the medical profession almost 20 years ago. This consists merely in applying a small piece of surgeon's adhesive plaster over the closed lips keeping them closed during all the hours of the night. The court plaster can be applied lengthwise over the lips, or it can be pasted across the lips, holding them firmly in the closed position. Many find the latter method the most practical. The more fresh air you can get in your home, your office, or school, or workshop, or wherever you may have to spend your daytime, the better off you'll be. End of section 3. Read by Martha Heaton, October 2023. End of the New Science of Controlled Breathing, Volume 1 and 2, by Edward Lanco.